Please welcome to the stage, co-founder and managing director of Bliss Lawyers, Debbie Epstein Henry and her panel participants. So hello everyone. So delighted to be here and a big thank you to Chips for obviously hosting this discussion. And I'm delighted to be here with my fellow panelists here and that is Stacia Kelly immediately to my left of DLA Piper and Karen Ulrich Stacy of OnRamp Fellowship. And we are delighted to have this conversation. What I want to do is just start with a personal story and then I'm going to be putting some questions to my panelists around taking smart risks in your career. But before I do that, I just want to set the context. I want to take you back to 1993. I was a newlywed and a third year in law school. My husband and I were at our favorite Upper West Side diner in New York and I wasn't really feeling right. And I sort of said, I'm feeling really out of sorts this is not right, we rushed back to the apartment, he laid me down on the bed, and I had a grand mal seizure. Had never had a seizure in my life, woke up, he was asking me who the president was, I was completely out of, source, out of sorts. We raced to the emergency room, my parents met us there, and the emergency room diagnosis was a brain tumor. My father, a doctor, got us to a great brain surgeon who met with us and he said, you know, this is a very strange, uh, the very strange scan here, but the way this brain tumor looks on the scan, it actually looks like a very rare parasite, typically found in Latin America. You're not the demographic. We're not going to know unless we do the brain surgery. So five days post-seizure, I went in for brain surgery at age 26, and my parents recount the brain surgeon jogging down the hall, screaming, it's a parasite. <laughs> so... After some, you know, steroids and some medication, after a few months, I was good as new. The reason why I share that story is having that experience at 26, being at my favorite diner, being told I've got a brain tumor that afternoon, and then five days later saying, no, you're going to be as good as new. I not only had a great lease on life, a new lease on life, but I said, I'm going to make sure I live the life that I want. And the, the chances of somebody like me having that parasite was one in 319,000. And the purpose of this story is to say, don't wait until some crazy thing happens to you till you start taking smart risks in your life and start living the life that you want to live. So with that context, I want to turn to my distinguished panel and start with you, Stacia. And, and ask, you've had this illustrious career. Talk about just some of those aspects and highlights of your career, but most importantly, how risk-taking has been integral to your success. Sure, well, first of all, it's gonna be really hard to follow that story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Having been the product of an Irish Catholic family in Dorchester in Boston, uh, the, the most risk I ever took as a child was skipping mass on Sunday. So, <laughs> you know, I did not come to this. I went to all girls Catholic schools all the way through college. Law school was my first non-sectarian co-educational experience. Uh, but one of the things that I learned really, really early on, and it came from my family basically, was, you know, you don't know what you don't know. You, you, you have a very limited world. I lived in a very limited world. My, my family was, as I said, Irish Catholic. My uncles were priests, uh, firemen, uh, or drunks. And actually, the third one was not mutually exclusive. <laughs> Two, um, own oh, firefighters, true. So anyway, so, but, but one of the things that was instilled in me when I was really young was you got to start opening your ears and opening your eyes and listening for opportunities. Bec and I thought that was great advice, but the real advice there is opportunities come with risks. And so when you hear the opportunities, when you understand that there's a path or paths, probably, hopefully more than one, and you decide to take one or the other, that's an opportunity that along with it carries the risk. So it's first of all being able to say, 
okay, I get this, I can do this. So the first time I took a real risk was when I left my law firm, Wilmer Cutler and Pickering, now Wilmer Hale, and went in-house. And, and I gotta tell you, I still look back at that and say, boy, I went in as a GC after being a fifth year partner at, at Wilmer, now Wilmer Hale, and I'm thinking to myself, if I ever knew then how much I didn't know <laughs> about being a general counsel, I wouldn't have left my office at Wilmer Cutler because there was just way too much risk that I could have failed. But I knew there was also an opportunity there, and I knew, by the way, that I had people behind me who were gonna help me succeed. Another key to my ability to take risk, I, had a, I have a great husband most of the time. <laughs> uh, and wonderful uh, boys who would go on Mom's Excellent Adventures as I made my way through four general counsel positions, all of which were a risk. So I think part of this is to turn, is to look at risk the way you also look at opportunity, as something that will open a door. Sure, you're going to close doors behind you, but that's going to happen anyway. In fact, if you never open a door, you've closed them all. And Stacia, I want to come back to what's behind all of those different roles that you had and really how confidence was so integral to that. But first, it, it would be great to hear from Karen. Same question, really, if you could talk about the amazing steps you've taken in your career and how risk-taking has been so integral to your success. Happy to. Hi, everyone. I have to tell you that having a mic on is problematic for me because not once did my mom say, Karen, please use your outside voice. <laughs> I'm trying really hard not to scream at you. Um, so as Debbie mentioned, I... Um, it was interesting how I got into law. I was a journalism major at University of Houston, and I thought I wanted to be a writer. And at U of H, University of Houston, it's a four-year program. Two years is learning in the classroom, and two years is a co-op. So I was so excited because I got this great co-op, and I was going to write for the Houston Chronicle, which for any of you that are Texans, there's two big papers, the Chronicle and the Post. The day that I was supposed to show up at my editorial internship, the other paper bought us, and they looked at me and said, we've got enough of you, people who don't know how to write yet. Um, and so I lost my editorial internship, and I had nothing. All of the great ones were taken, but this dean of University of Houston Law Center found out that I was looking for something to do, and he needed a warm body. So I went to work for the U of H dean, who was in the midst of writing his UCC treatises, so I spent two years writing uniform commercial code. Sounds really boring. <laughs> really boring? Sounds awful. Awful. It was fantastic for one reason. You like how I turned that into an optimistic yes. thing? Yes. Opportunity. Yeah. I um, got a chance to interact with a lot of different law firms, including Wall, Gottschall, and Mangies, and I ended up going there as their head recruiter. And that's what I've done for the last 20 or 25 years. I've been the head of talent for a lot of major law firms, Wall, Gottschall, Cooley, and most recently, Arnold and Porter. And that had a risk with it, too. So when I went to Arnold and Porter, I had just moved to Boulder, Colorado. And when I was interviewing for their chief talent officer job, the managing partner said to me, now, you keep mentioning Boulder. And I said, well, it's because it's where I live. And he said, oh, we didn't understand that. How about this? For the next eight hours of interviews, don't mention Boulder again. <laughs> So I went through eight hours of interviews, and at the end, I sat down and he said, so Karen, we want to offer you our first chief talent officer job. And I said, well, can I mention Boulder now? <laughs> and he said, you can, but it's a detail. Why are you worried about it? I'm not. So for seven years, I telecommuted from Boulder, Colorado to DC and to their eight other offices. And every time, and this is interesting, and we'll talk about this in a minute, every time that I had the chance to take a risk, it was a door that opened and it was clearly risky, but I just jumped through it, regardless of what was on the other side, and then just crossed my fingers. And granted, it typically has worked out, but there's been a lot of hardships, and there's been a lot of things where I've said, I'm not sure what would have happened. It's like sliding doors. You remember that Gwyneth Paltrow? Like, if I'd taken this door, what would have happened if I did this? But it is what it is. So after hiring 3,700 lawyers, I decided that um, we really weren't doing enough to understand what makes for a good lawyer, right? So half the lawyers I had hired were doing remarkably well, and half the lawyers that I had hired weren't doing as well. So I spent the last four years moneyballing lawyers. Did anybody see Brad Pitt's movie, Moneyball? Raise your hand. Yeah, so when I first started talking about Moneyball, the movie hadn't come out, and so I was having to explain Moneyball. As I was moneyballing lawyers, the movie had just come out, and I was like, you guys know the Brad Pitt movie? That's what I do. <laughs> Um, 
we found out that there is data and behavioral science and things that we weren't really paying as much attention to around what makes for successful lawyers. And so I'm using that now as part of Diversity Lab in order to help women who have taken a hiatus from practice come back into the law, the on-ramp fellowship. We're also using it to experiment with other new and innovative ways to increase diversity and inclusion in legal departments and in law firms. We ran the Woman in Law Hackathon a year and a half ago. In fact, Debbie was one of the team advisors, and her team won the entire hackathon. Nice it was job. actually really exciting. My husband's like, this is some volunteer effort. I haven't seen you this excited since like one of our kids was born. I'm like, I can't explain how thrilling this is and a tribute to you. It was amazing. It was a risk though, because every time I called a managing partner for, of a law firm, Mitch at Oric, I said, I'd really like you guys to participate in this women in law hackathon. And he said, we would love to, Karen. Remind me what a hackathon is. <laughs> And so he spent the first, I don't know, six months explaining what a hackathon, and everybody was very skeptical, because you know lawyers are skeptical. Um, but as part of that, there was risk, right? And, and you all, and, and in you participating in the hackathon, DLA participated in the hackathon as well. And in a minute, we'll talk about some of the research that I learned from interviewing and moneyballing thousands and thousands of lawyers over the last couple of, of years, and give you that knowledge so that you can take that away for your own careers. Wonderful. And so what is behind this issue around anxiety, around risk? The, I've surveyed lawyers around the country on this issue, and not surprisingly, the number one anxiety is this fear of failure. And so to look at us up here, who we are regular risk takers, well, that's easy. Oh, but we want to make sure we're relatable here and that actually our careers make sense to those who are in the audience here. So I want to turn back to you, Stacia, and ask you, how, how did, what are some real failures that you have faced, that you've seen others face, and most importantly, how do you ensure that you still take those risks even though you know those failures are very real? How do you get up that nerve to do that again? Well, well first, I think if you are not willing to take a risk, as I said before, that's a risk right there. Uh, keeping your ears and your eyes open for opportunity, but knowing, I mean, risk is a funny thing and failure is a funny thing. So first of all, I believe that there's a little bit of, and I know you're gonna do some of the research on this, of a gender, gender pardon me, that was my Boston accent, <laughs> of a gender uh, piece to this because so many times I hear young lawyers say, and, and lawyers who worked for me on my staff as a GC, looking for them to go take a, a more demanding job or take a promotion or put themselves in line, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready yet. I'm not sure that I can actually hit 100% of all those markers you've put out. When was the last time you heard a guy say that? I mean, most men would say, hey, I think I could do 75% of this and really nail it. I mean, I'm like And golden. nobody else is better for the job. And no one else that. is better for the job than I am. So part of this is actually we as women getting to the point that we say, it's okay, we're never gonna be perfect for every, in everything that we do. So that's a risk and there may be a piece of a failure there, but that's also growth. That's how you grow in a job. And as I said, my first job, if I had ever known what I didn't know, when I got there, I never would have taken that job. But you figure it out. I mean, there is a bit of, of moxie, obviously, that gets uh, at play here and a bit of self-confidence. And you know, sometimes you go home and drink a bottle of wine and cry that you actually did something really stupid and your husband pats you on the back and sends you to bed and you're all right. But because those things will happen, bad days, there will be definitely bad days and there will be failures that you have. But failure, as I said earlier, is also a funny word. What does that mean? I mean, if you, if you really, first of all, in our, in our profession, you know, we're, thank God we're not doctors, right? I mean, you take a risk in our profession and people don't usually die. So good news is you can take a risk, you can fail, and you can get up and dust yourself off and just move forward. The key to that is what did I learn from that? What did I learn from that stumble? Most of the failures that I've had, uh, either not getting a job I wanted or really not finding the right solution to a business issue where, where it was staring in front of me, which I saw a week later, you know, okay, it was, a, it was a mistake. There was a risk. It was a failure. But what did I learn from it? What am I going to do differently next time I'm facing that situation? It makes it much easier to recognize the risk and then to take it. And the other thing about failure, particularly for in-house folks, since I was in four, I couldn't keep a job. I was in four GC jobs uh, in my career. The other thing about failure is, especially in companies, failure is a very funny thing. You can fail because 
you know, your, your CEO got changed out and the new one doesn't like you, right? That's not a failure, that's life. That's just life in the big city. So you gotta separate true risk and true effort and failure from, you know, life in the big city, it is what it is. You pick yourself up in that situation and you move on in, into another, another position. One of the best things in my career was getting fired. Uh, I got fired from the general counsel job at Sears Roebuck uh, because a new, new GC, a new CEO came in, fired everybody. I was not alone. I was the last one he fired. Uh, but it, it, it gave me two years of a, of a severance agreement, severance payment, and I went off to get one of the best jobs in my life, which I never would have gone to but for that, which was uh, doing the bankruptcy at WorldCom MCI. So it's the opportunities that came from the failure that came from the risk I took in the first place. So there, there's so much packed in, in that answer, and I'm just trying to parse it out, but so much of your story is around resilience, and it's about letting go of this perfectionist notion, which many of us as women kind of hang on to more as men, and this issue around readiness, which again relates to perfectionism. Do we have to have 100% of the qualifications before we raise our hand? So Karen, being somebody who is steeped in the research, can you give us some context to this you know, sort of increased gender aversion to risk and sort of what is behind part of that readiness issue and perfectionism? Yeah, so I can. So one of the downsides to being a lawyer, I know there's some good things and some downsides. One of the downsides is that when we study you all's personalities, there's some things that are common among lawyers. And for those of you that have seen Larry Richard's work, some of you are smiling because you're like, what's she gonna say bad about us? So as lawyers, when we look at you against the general population, and in clinic, clinical science, it's called the sane population. So when we compare you to the sane population, um, sane, that doesn't mean S -A -N -E. you're insane. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't mean you're insane. It's just talking about the broader sane population. You all have, as lawyers, lower resilience by half of the general sane population. And then when you look at your analytical skills, you've got double the analytical skills of the sane population that's also studied. And what that means for you all, that risk taking and bouncing back is almost a double whammy, right? So you have low resilience, you have high analytical skills. So this is what this looks like. You make a mistake and then you're like, after you say, fuck, then, what did I do wrong? What did the other person do wrong? How, did that, how could that situation have gone down better? What could I have done differently? What could she have done differently? Who, who was involved in this that shouldn't be involved in this? Who got blamed? Who didn't get blamed? And by the time you're all done with it, it is a mess in your head. And it gets messier at night when it's quiet. Unless you have that bottle of wine in there. Yeah. <laughs> Loss of well, consciousness helps. If you're, yeah. if you're like me and you're getting older and the bottle of wine keeps you up even more, <laughs> then you just wrestle with it all night long versus just those few hours. And so what's interesting about lawyers is that resilience is a really important thing for you all because you have this overworked analytical ability, right? You're trained all day long to issue spot. So it makes perfect sense that when something doesn't go as well as you want it to, that you would issue spot. That's what you've been trained to do. But here's the good news. You can also train your brain. It's called, and I won't get into the science behind it, but it's called cognitive reframing. And University of Penn has done a lot on positive psychology and that type of thing that can help you build your resilience piece by piece by piece. Because right, we can't stand up here and say, hey, take a risk, go for it. Just a small risk, see what happens. Because you're not gonna do it. Your brain is gonna issue spot whether you want it to or not. But instead, we can help you train your brain. So. In doing the research, and, and part of this was for the on-ramp fellowship, because for these women that are coming back into the profession, we study them. We study their skills, their behaviors, we study their values, and then we study that on the law firm and on the legal department side, because we want to know what makes for a successful human in that legal department or in that law firm. And in studying almost 500 lawyers, so we've done 500 hour-long interviews with high-performing legal department and law firm partners and leaders. And by the way, the interviews are only supposed to be 30 minutes. And that's all you'll schedule with me until I get you on the phone talking about yourself. Then it's 40 <laughs> minutes, then it's 50 minutes. And I plan for an hour, just so you know. So what we learned in doing these interviews is that the, the folks in your legal departments and law firms that have thrived and survived 
have some little tricks and techniques that they use that helps build their resilience, that helps build their confidence, because those two things are correlated as, skill, as skills. And I was gonna tell you just a couple of them as potential takeaways for you. And some of these things I've now incorporated into my own life, because in doing the research, I've learned a lot about resilience. So two things, one is to build resilience into your daily life. And you think, well, okay, I would need to fail to build resilience <laughs> into my daily life. But what is meant by that from a positive psychology standpoint is, you know how, and I'll give you an example. You know how they say if you wanna lose weight, visualize it? Like put a picture of that model or whoever you're trying to look like in front of you? The same thing is true of building resilience. So a number of people that I talked to that were building their own resilience did really small things like, and I started doing this as well, their passwords are something that would help them build resilience. So my password, which I'm, I'm, I'm changing it now because I'm about to tell you what it is publicly, but and, uh, anybody that does privacy and data is freaking out <laughs> in the room. One of my passwords, not for my bank account, was leverage all no's. And in a minute, I'll tell you what that means. But it means that you're going to hear no. But in a minute, I'll tell you what women and, and men that we talked to did to leverage no's. But I had that password because more than even you eat and drink wine during the day, you enter your password, right? So leverage all knows, 2017 exclamation, because whoever created that's making me do one character and one capital letter. <laughs> leverage all knows, 2017 exclamation. And every time I would see that, I would think, I'm gonna get a no today, but I'm gonna leverage it. And I'll tell you what some women that I talked to did to leverage that. The other thing that I learned from positive psychology and talking to some women and men who were trying to train their brain to be more resilient is that every night when they laid down, so when you were having that conversation with yourself about what you could have done different and better and what went well and what didn't go well, write it down. Either take a pad of paper or enter it into your iPhone or your Blackberry or whatever. Do we still have Blackberry? Not really. Okay. <laughs> enter it into whatever happy device you're using currently and do three things. First, tell that device or that paper, what didn't go well today? And which of those things was in your control and which wasn't, right? Because that's part of the issue, and Stacia, you brought that up. Some of these things are not in our control. So part of it's just purging that this thing happened and that you just need to say it out loud or get it written down or type it in. So the first thing is write down what didn't go well and what you could have done differently about it, if anything. Two, what, wrote down what really went well today. What made me a rock star today? And it's little stuff. I was telling Stacia and Debbie that just getting here today is gonna be on my little note card tonight. <laughs> my father-in-law had a stent put in, my mom's salt was emptying her kidneys, my babysitter quit unexpectedly, and I flew my babysitter from Colorado into California to take care of my child because my husband is also traveling. So getting on that flight today and being able to make it here, I'm writing that down tonight. <laughs> Got to the Chips Rockstar. event. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you would ask, why did I come? This is easier than what I was dealing with back there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. Don't tell anyone. Right. Um, and then the third thing is, what risk are you going to take tomorrow? Right? It's going to be a small risk. You're not likely going to go ask for a promotion or a raise tomorrow unless you want to and you need to. But what's the small risk that you're going to take tomorrow that's going to advance your career or advance your business or help someone else advance their career or their business? And what's really interesting about risk is that we found from research that when you all are taking a risk for someone else, including your dog, you're much more willing to stand in front of them and take that risk than you are for yourself. So think about risk not only on how I can help myself, but who else am I helping and how can I propel their career or their business or their life as a result of also looking at how that will potentially help me. That's a great point. I'm sorry. And I Go wonder ahead. if there's a gender thing to that as well. I don't know if you see that with women versus men. But it is really true. I mean, you think about it. It's, it's often easier to take a risk for somebody else, to put yourself in, in harm's way for somebody else. Right. I mean, I think what's interesting about this is what is behind so much of this, again, is confidence and in, in how you get the confidence to build up your risk tolerance, which is really what this is about. And when you think about research from, let's say, Claire Shipman, who co-authored The Confidence Code, as it relates to gender, to your point, she found two interesting things. One is that, as girls, many of us were trained to be good girls and get in line. And risk-taking is not about 
be getting in line. It's about being outside the line. So part of it is how we were raised, as like, this is a good girl, this is what she's supposed to do. But the other piece of it, and partly it may again be because of how we're raised, is the expectation of how we're going to behave. So not only do we have to worry about, oh, well, we're going outside the lines, we were taught not to, but when we finally get up the nerve to do that, we're often in work environments where it's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't expect her to do that. That's not, so you're not even embraced for doing it when you finally get up the nerve to do that. So that's my question to you, really, Stacia, is that you've had all of these exemplary risks that you've taken, and you've been embraced in these environments as leaders, not only in these four GC roles, but certainly now as co-managing partner of DLA Piper. So that's my question to you, is even if you've mastered the confidence building yourself, how do you get to the next level of having colleagues respect you for it and embrace you for it and not have you cast aside because you're that aggressive woman who is stepping out of line? You know, you, until you asked me that question earlier, Debbie, I had never actually thought about that. But when I go back to my upbringing, having gone to all women's schools, first of all, I didn't have the, you know, I was, I was supposed to be a good girl, obviously, because I was a yeah, good Catholic girl in good Catholic school. But being a good girl in the context of women in a classroom is very different than it is in a, in a co-ed situation. So I was very comfortable getting up in front of people and just saying my piece. In fact, I got punished in the second grade for correcting Sister Catherine St. John for misspelling a word on the blackboard. So my mother knew that there was definitely <laughs> going to be an issue with this <laughs> child, right? But nobody ever told me I shouldn't do that. So when I got into a male-dominated society, which of course as soon as I got out of college and before I went to law school, I worked for a bit before I went back to law school, I was only surrounded, I was surrounded only by men, right? So my real issue for myself is how am I gonna do this? What am I gonna do? And the first meeting I ever had when I worked for Martin Marietta who sent me to law school as it turned out, I was the only woman in the room full of a whole bunch of men and all aerospace engineers and all these guys and they t one of the guys came in and turned to me and said, oh honey, would you, can, can you get, could you get us some coffee? Right, and I, th I sat there and I thought to myself, oh, okay, what do I do with that? So I could, get, I could say to him, are you fucking kidding me? I'm, <laughs> I'm a professional just like you. Well, I wasn't gonna say that, but I was gonna say, I, I could have said, no, I'm uh, an analyst here at Martin Marietta. I'm not gonna get you coffee or you know, I could go get him coffee and make sure that he knew after I got him coffee that I was there in, my, in a professional capacity, which is of course what I did. And it was a great lesson because he was mortified that he had done that. And he never forgot it. And he used to talk me up all, you know, throughout the company uh, as long as I was there. But what that led me to do is say, you know, I need to make sure I'm reading the room. I, I think we women also have a good ability to read people reading their reactions, that's huge when you're in a room full of men. So you can go, you all should try this, you can go into your next meeting that'll be dominated by men, and you can watch their, you know, the silent, like, eyebrow raising, or the, <clears throat> the, like this, or just sort of the listening to you. All of those signals, you pick up those signals, you respond to them in as positive a way as you can, and the other element that I inject, which I do, it's my personality, fortunately, because that's not forced, but is humor. Humor can break down so many stressful situations. Absolutely. And humor can make the aggressive bitch look like a funny person who also is smart, right? I mean, it can turn the way people look at you. I use that all the time. Uh, and I've used it, as I said, all my career. And that does help uh, take, the, take the edge off what might otherwise be something that is not as tolerable as it could be. Right, and I think, you know, of course, it's what's natural to us. I, I similarly like to use humor. This sort of self-deprecating piece, right. of course, can, can work really well. Especially with men. Right, exactly, uh, affirming them. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, sorry about that. I'm the only one who hasn't cursed up here yet, so I'm just trying to bring some sort of edge. <laughs> Um, I'll get to it, don't worry. I'll backwards. work it in. Yeah, no, 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 it's good. Um, Karen, related to this issue around, you know, being that powerful woman in the room and, but being embraced and respected for it and not, you know, having to have to incur the wrath of colleagues or at least being able to dispense with that. A related issue is about demonstrating your value and how to effectively 
claim your contributions in a room and not be the obnoxious self-promoter. How do you do that in this issue around, again, showing real confidence through risk-taking, but also being able to be that team player, but also demonstrate your leadership and really own it in a way that, again, is still going to be embraced by your colleagues? So there are three common ways. When we interviewed these 500-plus high-performing women and men, there were three common ways among everyone that we interviewed. And what was interesting is, if you're a researcher or you're a data geek like me, you go into problem solving with a theory on what's going to happen. And I thought there were going to be these huge differences between what men did and what women did. And it turns out on this one, men are doing it the same way as women in terms of advocating for themselves, but it's packaged differently, right? So when they do, it might be different. Um, how how they use their words might be different. So one of the things, for instance, we do computational text analysis of the I love me memos or the self avows that you all write. And one of the things that we find, so in law firms, you know, I call them their I love me memo because at the end of the year, you're supposed to write how great you are. <laughs> and, in, and in legal departments, some of you have self avows where you're supposed to write how great you are before someone else tells you how great or not you are. And as part of that, it's interesting because women use we and men use I an awful lot. And so we were finding, right, that in these computational text analyses that although people were advocating for themselves directly a lot of times, men would use we and women, excuse me, vice versa, women would use we and men would use us. But there were two findings that I thought were incredible, and I hadn't really realized this. So the direct advocating happens for both women and men, and it depends on that person's personality, it depends on the trust relationships they have, and it depends on how long they've been at their organization. But the two that I thought were interesting that I hadn't really identified previously as commonalities among high performers were advocating through teaming. And let me explain to you what that means. It looked a little different for each person. But instead of saying to the managing partner or to the partner or to the managing director of the legal department, hey, I did this thing really well today and I want you to hear about it, they said, hey, I want to make sure you know what my team just accomplished. And by doing that, they're talking not only about the two people on their team or the one person on their team, if you're leanly staffed, or the eight people, um, but they also then got a chance to tell what they have done. They also did that in email, which I found interesting and asked some of them to forward it to me because there's research to show that if in a fleeting moment you're verbally telling someone how great they are, that next fleeting moment they might forget. But if you write it down and you're incredibly articulate about what you've said and then they have to read it and visibly see it, it sticks. It's a stickiness factor in reading something versus hearing something. So a couple of them forwarded their emails, and it was like things like this. Hey, I just wanted you to know we partnered on the business side. This is an in-house legal department. We partnered on the business side with our clients. We were able to do this, 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 and this. And I want to call out in particular these two members of my team who were really helpful in this matter. It would be great if you could go to them and also say thank you. So what she did, which I thought was interesting, is she made it sticky twice. Right? She's like, look how great we are, now go thank them. It becomes sticky again. The other thing I saw people do were what we call client pass-throughs. So your client, whether that's on the business side or on the law firm side, sends you an email and says, hey, great job on this, or thanks. Sending that on to whomever supervises you or does your evaluation just to say, I thought you might be interested in seeing this. We saw a lot of client pass-throughs. And then the last one, which I thought was really interesting, are what we call elevator bursts. So I think about this as if when you get in an elevator, and I know in New York this is different than California and in Texas, because in New York no one looks at each other and you try not to talk, but in Texas we all talk to each other. And when you get in, typically somebody says, hey, how you doing? High-performing lawyers don't miss that opportunity to advocate for themselves. So a lot of folks that we talked to would get in the elevator with the managing director of the legal department or whomever, and they would say, hey, how are you doing? And the person would say, I'm doing great. In fact, you know, we just had this really good outcome in this case that I'm so excited about. You laugh, but folks that are high-performing lawyers are not missing these opportunities to client pass through, to thank their team while also getting the accolades for themselves, and they're not taking, they're not missing the opportunity to take that elevator pitch or bursts. And you could do it anywhere, right? It could happen while you're in an Uber or in a Lyft driving somewhere. But they don't miss the opportunity to take some time to advocate for themselves. The other thing that we found was they find amplifiers for them. So for those of you who say, gosh, 
I'm just not sure that's authentic to me. I'm not sure I would do a client pass through or I'm not sure I would send something thanking my team or maybe I don't have a team yet. <laughs> Take a risk and try to hire someone. Um, they find credible amplifiers. And I thought this was interesting, right? Because there's all this talk about mentors and sponsors. This is different, right? It's not finding that person who has advocated for you or helped champion your career. It's the person that you might have worked on a particular case or a matter with. It's a person on the business side that you might have partnered to figure out something for the business. And saying to that person, hey, if you get a chance, this seemed like it worked out pretty well, the relationship was good and I did good work for you. If you get a chance, would you relay that information to whomever? And you know what's interesting? Is when you ask for help, for whatever reason, people are so excited to help you. Right, so if you need help and you ask for help, which by the way, as women, sometimes we don't do that enough, but a lot of these women that we talk to would ask someone to amplify their efforts and would ask someone to advocate or champion something that they had done in an effort to show the next person up the chain. And one of my favorite anecdotal stories was this woman who kept asking this partner with whom she worked that she hated to amplify. And everybody in the firm hated this partner. And I, I let her talk for the 35 minutes she talked about this, and then I said, why do you ask somebody you don't like to amplify for you or to advocate for you? And she said, are you kidding me? He's the most difficult partner in this entire firm. If he advocates you for you, you must be the most successful person <laughs> in this whole firm. So think about that too in terms of who you're asking to amplify your messaging. It doesn't have to be the person that you think is your mentor or your sponsor. There's people all around you that you're working with that think you have done a good job, and there is no harm in asking them to amplify and advocate on your behalf. I think those are some great suggestions. I want to actually piggyback on the one you talked to uh, talked about with this client pass through, where you know you get accolades, let's say, as a law firm lawyer for doing something, and you want to just pass it through to, let's say, the managing partner of your firm. What I'd add to that is I see people successfully self-promoting, -promo particularly when they align their own self-promotion with a benefit for the firm. So sending that same email, but writing a cover note saying, you know, we've been handling Jim's environmental work for years. We've talked about growing the relationship to start handling their corporate work. He seems really excited about this most recent success we had. Maybe now's the time to take Jim out for lunch and talk about expanding the relationship. So that idea of, again, that same email is forward, forwarded, but the idea of actually pairing it with success for the firm, the bigger opportunity for everybody's interest, is a really nice way to sort of sneak in that self-promotion, but again, empowering the people you're working with so that it's a team effort and again, for the benefit of the firm. Yeah, and so an, a related issue, it doesn't really have anything to do with the risk, but I, I've begun to see the, the power of it now because there are enough women, and look at this audience, it's wonderful to see all of these women in this room, who are in, uh, in corporations who can actually benefit their, their female colleagues that, who, with whom they work and, and like to work in firms by actually thinking about that pass-through, thinking about being the author of that pass-through and getting even the message directly to a managing partner at a law firm that Debbie was, did a great job and you just should know that. And maybe, maybe there's a different conversation that happens around Debbie than there might otherwise have been. It's very powerful. I absolutely agree. And Stacia, I want to pick up on something you referenced before that you has the beneficiary of a mostly supportive husband. I think, yeah, we're, we're all in that mostly category. That's the operative word. But anyway, that's another conversation, right? Um, how, what about, you know, either you don't have that support or you have, you know, sort of different circumstances, whatever it may be. What are different supports that you've used and others could use, like a CHIPS network, but others that really help, again, with that confidence in how to push you to take those smart risks. Can you give examples of some other supports? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my husband was my first mentor, so I do say that I can go bounce off. He, he was FBI and DEA, so, and he ran the personnel in the, in the FBI for a long time, so he had a lot of interesting challenges. But my good girlfriends can do this too, or guy friends who I have. I think it's really important that you have at least a couple of people that you can bounce issues off and that you can, and they will be honest with you in giving you feedback, honest, not just supportive. It's great to be supportive, but you want people who can honestly say, I don't think that this makes a lot of sense here, or I'm hearing you say this when I really think you're saying this. So it's really the, the, the uh, friendship, 
and I don't think it's, or, CHIPS is a great organization, but it's the people you meet here. It's the people who you meet here that you can then develop a relationship with. Organizations in and of themselves, I don't think, have the ability to zero in on someone and be able to give it, because it's real emotional linkage and real actual feedback, real time, into what it is you're experiencing. And getting it from somebody who's been there, done that, is obviously helpful. And it, and it, you can cha it should change. You should have these in various parts of your lives, not just at home, at, at the office, with your girlfriends. I mean, people who will really be honest with you and help you gu guide you through that. And what I would add to that is really the importance of pushing back with people. So some people are inclined to be complimentary. So, you know, Seisha, if I asked for real I feedback. I don't have those people in my life, actually. <laughs> right. But if you did, assuming you did, the idea, you know, if you were giving me feedback and you were super positive, for me to take ownership and say, okay, I'm so glad you've been pleased with my work. If there's one thing right. that I can work on that would be an opportunity for me. So taking that responsibility to push back and delve deeper, and by the way, if you ask that question of multiple people with whom you work and you get the same response, you know right. <laughs> that those are something you really need to be working on. Right. So I want to turn to you, Karen, and ask you that same kind of question. How do you build different types of supports? Which types of supports do you think are particularly helpful in, again, building up that risk tolerance? So ditto, and then I won't say anything else. How's that? Instead wow, that's the first time it's ever Stacia happened. Right. <laughs> said. And right. I know we only have five minutes left, so I wonder if we want to turn to takeaways before we go. Sure, I'm happy to do that. And I think one thing we really want to leave you with is if there's one thing that you can suggest of the audience to do tomorrow in furtherance of some risk you're all contemplating, big or small, what are some steps, one or more, that you can take tomorrow to further that risk. Karen, you want to start? Be happy to. So I told you my password. I'm repeating it again. Your for former the, password. Yeah. The cameras <laughs> and the, all of you. Leverage all knows. And the reason that I have that as my password and all, I'm doing it kind of to train my brain to get used to and to take no's. Because one of the things that you learn about salespeople, right, when you look at the DNA of salespeople, when you moneyball them, they're optimistic, which is also why they can get nine no's <laughs> out of the 10 questions that they've asked. And for lawyers, that's a lot harder, right? You get one no and you feel like emotionally shattered by it. Mm -hmm. And so what I want my takeaway for you all to be is to leverage your no's, right? So in interviewing all of these women, one of the things that I thought was so remarkable is when I asked them, when you hear no, what do you do? Some of them cry, <laughs> but some of them said things like, I, and they didn't say it exactly like this, these are my words, but I leverage the no. So if I'm sitting in front of somebody and they're telling me that they're passing me over for a promotion, I don't just take that no. I say, okay, thank you for letting me know that. Um, and you know, and this person was saying to us, like, I know this person wants me to stay at this company. They don't want to lose me, but I'm just apparently not right for this particular job. So I took that opportunity to say, what can I, can we revisit it in six months, right? So instead of saying no and hearing no and then walking out of that person's office, they said, how can I leverage the no? Could we revisit this in six months? Another woman, when we asked her, said, I took that opportunity to ask for more headcount. I know the person doesn't want to lo lose me, so if I leave, that's detrimental to the company, but they're not promoting me, fine, I understand that I'm not getting this promotion, but I know data privacy is really important to you. Could I get an additional person who could work on this matter? The person sitting on the other side of the table is more likely to say yes after they've said no. There's science behind that. FBA, FBI investigators, by the way, will get no first on purpose in hostage negotiations because they know the second thing they're gonna get is a yes. So my advice to you is when you hear no, stop and think, how can I leverage that? How could it be a no, not now, not a no, not ever? Terrific. That's why my husband asked me to marry him twice because the first thing <laughs> he's obviously like very resilient. Very Great resilient. Data. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I guess what I would say is, um, Tomorrow, um, open your ears and listen for the opportunity to take the risk. It probably happens to all of us every day in some little way, and obviously they're not going to be life-altering risks you're going to be asked to take every day. But listen for the, the, the thing that you're being asked to do or to think about or to participate in that makes you a little uncomfortable. And put your toe in the water and take that risk. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, it only means it didn't work out. It doesn't mean you failed. 
It doesn't mean you should not do it again. It just gives you the ability to next time say, okay, that wasn't so bad. I can stick my toe in this pool again and maybe get to the deep end at some point and, and come up to the surface. So listening for the opportunity to take a risk. And the one thing we didn't get to that I do want to say, because it was one of your questions that I thought was great, which, which was to what extent are happiness and passion legitimate forces in the ability to do what we do and take risks and fail, huge, huge. I mean, what you guys do every day is really hard stuff, whether you're in a law firm or a company, and to balance it with all the other things going on in your life, it's huge. If, if there's not passion and happiness or the potential for happiness attached to that, at least I'd go do something else. It's really <laughs> important. And I, those are excellent points from both of you. And I want to sort of compliment the prior point you made around listening for those opportunities with one suggestion, which is make the ask. Now, I didn't say ask. I just was hoping to get one curse out there. But I actually said ask as in A-S-K. <laughs> and what I mean by that is so much of risk taking is actually asking. It's asking for the opportunity to lead that team. It's asking for that promotion. It's asking to lead a new litigation. Whatever that ask is, that's what you need to push yourself to do. And the more asks that you make, the easier it's going to be to face those rejections at times, but also to ask again. And that's what this is about, not perfection, it's about resilience and asking and asking again. So with that, I wanna thank this amazing panel And thank all of you, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you for attending the panel discussion. Enjoy some treats from Bluebird Bakery in the foyer. General session resumes back here at 3.15 p.m.